So one common respiratory condition that we're faced with in our patients has a significant impact on both morbidity and mortality, and also directly impacts our management strategy. And in the next couple lessons, we'll dive into the details of acute respiratory distress syndrome. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. So acute respiratory distress syndrome is a very common condition that we're going to come across, especially in the day and age of COVID. It's certainly not unique to COVID though, and really has been something that we've always had to manage. In the next couple lessons, I am going to attempt to cover the details of this syndrome and really hopefully give you guys a better understanding of this disease and our management of it. So let's start things off and talk about what is acute respiratory distress syndrome or something that we refer to as ARDS or ARDS. So ARDS is really a complicated process that consists of an acute diffuse alveolar inflammation and then really subsequent damage and is a life-threatening condition for our patients. So I'm going to cover the pathophysiology of what happens in just a minute here, but ultimately the resulting inflammation damages lung tissue, and this is from alveoli to capillaries, and leads to diffuse pulmonary infiltrates, hypoxemia, and then ultimately heavy, non-compliant, stiff lungs. And one of the hallmarks of ARDS is that it is acute in origin, so being seven days or less from the initial insult. Now, typically it's going to present itself with a matter of hours or sometimes just within a few days, but anything within seven days is going to be our classification here as being acute. And as far as ARDS go, it's probably been around as long as we have, but it really was first described in 1967, and then over subsequent years, it was kind of further defined and clarification resulted from that. The most common definition that we use today is what we call the Berlin definition, and this was really devised in 2012 by the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, and then it was later adopted by the American Thoracic Society and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. And there are four criteria to meet the Berlin definition of ARDS. First, we have to have an acute onset, so like I said, onset in one week or less. Two, we have to have diffuse bilateral pulmonary infiltrates or radiographic opacities that are going to be consistent with pulmonary edema. Third, we must exclude cardiogenic pulmonary edema and fluid overload as the cause. And then fourth and finally, our PaO2 to FiO2 ratio or our PF ratio being less than 300 millimeters of mercury with at least 5 centimeters of PEEP, CPAP, or EPAP in place. And we'll kind of go over this a little bit more in the next lesson when I actually talk a little bit more about the diagnosis of ARDS, but just understand these are the criteria that have to be met in order for the Berlin definition to be met. And so when it comes to our prognosis of this, ARDS often presents in as many as a quarter of all intubated patients. So definitely something that you're going to come across. It has a significant impact on outcomes, and really the mortality of ARDS usually hangs out in the ballpark of 30 to 40%. And then we can categorize the severity of ARDS and its associated mortality that goes with it. So first we have our mild cases, and here we're going to have that PF ratio of 200 to 300, 
and this carries a mortality of 27%. So even the mild cases of ARDS still have a pretty significant mortality. And we see about 25% of all ARDS cases that are initially classified as mild, but of these, about a third of those later progress into moderate or severe cases. So then speaking of, next we have moderate, and then here this is where we're going to have that PF ratio of 100 to 200, and this has a mortality of 32%. And then finally for severe, this is going to be our PF ratio that's less than 100, and this one we're looking at a mortality of 45%. So essentially this is a pretty significant lung disease process that really carries with it some pretty significant mortality. Now, in order to understand what is happening with the patient with ARDS, and even more so to understand the how and why for our management, you really need to understand about the underlying pathophysiology. So let's start off with the basics of what is normal. So here is a basic alveolus. So we've got our alveolus with the associated capillary. The alveolus itself is actually made up of two different types of cells that we call pneumocytes. We have our type 1 pneumocytes, and these really form most of the epithelial surface of the alveoli, as well as they constitute almost half of the membrane that we have the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide that they must cross in order for that gas exchange to take place down here by the capillary. Then scattered throughout, we have our type 2 pneumocytes, and these are going to be larger cuboidal cells that really kind of serve several purposes. The primary function of these cells is going to be the production of surfactant as well as epithelial repair. Now, hopefully you remember with surfactant that this helps to decrease the surface tension and really helps to keep the alveoli open. Now, with these type 2 cells, there are also several other functions, but one of note is that there's also these fluid channels in the cells, and these really help to move fluid that's inside the alveolus to the outside environment. So remember that we often draw this as a very simple drawing, but in fact we're talking about different cells serving different purposes in these drawings. So that's why I drew them out here, just to help us visualize that these are cells here. Now for our capillary down here, this is really a simplified representation of the capillary, but as we know that the capillary bed itself also consists of cells, so we've got a single layer of epithelial cells that are creating a passageway for blood cells and blood to go through, and really to bring those red blood cells as close as possible to participate in gas exchange. So again, we have these capillary epithelial cells lining here, and then these cells make up almost half of the membrane that, again, the fusion must take place across. Now in between these alveolar and capillary epithelial cells, we do have this space called the interstitial space. Now this is normally a very narrow space and it primarily consists of connective tissue in there. Now as we know when gas comes in that we have O2 that's going to diffuse across this membrane down into the capillary and to our red blood cells. And then we're going to have CO2 that's diffusing back across the opposite direction to be exhaled away. Because of this incredibly thin alveolar capillary membrane and this very small interstitial space that this diffusion easily takes place. So this is our normal setup and our normal arrangement for our alveolus and our capillary and kind of how we expect things things to work here. With ARDS though, we can actually have several processes taking place that are really sometimes going to vary based on the underlying disease process that's going on, but I did want to kind of talk through some of these changes with you guys. And the first of these are actually going to be our alveolar changes. So we can have inflammation and damage to the cells of the alveolus and that alveolar membrane. By having inflammation, that this can lead to membrane permeability, as well as potentially apoptosis or cell death. So if you can imagine due to this inflammation that we can start to see these gaps in between the cells forming up this membrane that they start to open up, as well as if you have cell death here, just imagine that some of these cells are disappearing. Now, if we have damage or death of the type 2 cells, that this is going to lead to overall decreased surfactant that's available in the alveolus, and this is going to increase the risk of alveolar collapse and then ultimately atelectasis. And then if we have damage or death of our type 1 cells, the ones that form our membrane, that this is going to also increase that membrane permeability along with those gaps in between from the inflammation, and this is potentially going to allow fluid to come in inside of the alveolus. Now the death of these cells along with the immune activation can also lead to a buildup of cellular debris
debris inside the alveolus as well. And so whether it be fluid inside the alveolus, that cellular debris also building up inside there, or the atelectasis of the alveolus collapsing, we're going to have less surface area that's going to be available for this diffusion to take place and ultimately our gas exchange, which is going to contribute to our hypoxemia. Now, in addition to those changes with the alveolus, we also have changes that can take place with the capillary. So things like inflammation, our inflammatory markers, our cytokines, as well as endotoxins can all lead to damage of our capillary endothelial cells. Just as in the alveolus, the inflammation here can lead to the increased permeability of these capillaries and then opening up those spaces in between each cell. And if you think this is a normal process for inflammation, as it really was designed to allow white blood cells to leave the blood and then enter into damaged tissue. As a result, our white blood cells, such as our neutrophils and our macrophages, are going to migrate into the alveoli, helping to contribute to some of the issues that we previously just mentioned. This increased permeability of the capillary cells also means that fluid can now leave the vasculature and then enter into this interstitial space. So as this fluid builds up here, the interstitial space is going to become larger, making the diffusion of gases harder which is also going to be contributing to hypoxemia. Now, if we have enough fluid in this interstitial space and or whether the alveolar membrane itself is compromised, that this fluid can also work its way into the alveolus, further impacting gas exchange and hypoxemia. Having this additional fluid in the interstitial space, though, is also going to put pressure on the alveolus itself and can contribute to its collapse. And it's this added fluid and pressure that's really responsible for the heavier lung that we see in ARDS, as well as some of the decreased compliance, as really we're working against the expansion of the alveoli with all this fluid, especially if those alveoli have already collapsed. Now, on top of all of this, the potential damage and death of our capillary endothelial cells can also lead to additional fluid or potentially blood entering into the interstitial space and then potentially the alveoli themselves, once again contributing to our hypoxemia. Now, on top of our alveolar changes and our capillary changes, we also see some changes with our pulmonary vasculature. And this is going to be due to increasing hypoxia and hypercapnia that we're often going to see vasoconstriction, which is going to lead to some varying degree of pulmonary hypertension, which can have an influence on cardiac output, especially for patients that have right-sided weakness or heart failure. And this vasoconstriction is just the body's natural response to hypoxia and hypercapnia. This is normally what we would expect to have happen. So regardless of the degree of the aforementioned pathophysiologic changes, one commonality with ARDS is that we're going to have the presence of an intrapulmonary shunt or a VQ mismatch. Now I did discuss this some in the previous lesson on respiratory failure, but essentially the situation that we have here is that we have good perfusion of lung tissue where good gas exchange is not taking place. This is our definition of the intrapulmonary shunt. So we have an imbalance or a mismatch between our ventilation, which is our V, and our perfusion, which is our Q, giving us that VQ mismatch. So again, limited or no ventilation with good perfusion. This is what we call the shunt. And so essentially, because of all this, this is going to be allowing deoxygenated blood to return to the left side of the heart and then onto the rest of the body, impacting our systemic perfusion. And in fact, the biggest contributor to mortality in patients with ARDS is actually multi-organ failure. And this is going to be as a result of having that decreased perfusion. Mortality from hypoxemia directly actually accounts for a much lower proportion. And then also because of this shunt, the patient is often not going to respond to the administration of oxygen alone as the oxygen just can't make it to where it can participate in that gas exchange. And so one important thing to know is that our patient's cardiac output is going to have an effect on the impact of the intrapulmonary shunt on our systemic perfusion. So what this means is the lower the cardiac output, the greater the proportion of deoxygenated blood that's going to compose our systemic circulation. Therefore, changes in our patient's cardiac output can have a large impact on uh, ultimately perfusion. 
Now, finally, as the disease process begins to resolve and healing begins, that really depending on the severity as well as the length of time, the patient is at risk for fibrosis. So we have fibrin strands that are going to be deposited into the interstitial space that can lead to permanently enlarging the space and stiffening it as well. And ultimately, this can lead to lifelong problems by making the diffusion and thus the gas exchange more difficult, as well as having stiffer, less compliant lungs for the patient for the rest of their lives. So we kind of went over a lot of different things pathophysiologically that are happening with our patient with ARDS here, from those changes that are happening with the alveoli to the capillary itself, the larger changes that we see an impact on the pulmonary hypertension, the intrapulmonary shunt, and then ultimately long-term that fibrosis. Hopefully that information kind of makes sense in terms of what's happening and some of the impacts that we would see from that. So next I do want to hit on some of the causes of ARDS. One big thing to understand though with ARDS is that it's not just one disease, but it's really the collection of many different diseases that can lead to ARDS. So ARDS is really just the expected response to many different etiologies. When we kind of talk about these different causes, though, we can really think of our causes and lump them into our primary and secondary causes. So our primary causes are something that we also call our direct causes, and this is going to be the result of direct damage to the alveolar membrane. So think direct damage and inflammation taking place. Some of the causes that we would consider our primary or direct causes would be things like aspiration. So we're going to have that decrease in pH of our gastric contents as well as the introduction of bacteria coming in there. We can have a pulmonary contusion and typically these are going to be the result of trauma. And so here think that that contusion, this is direct damage to our pulmonary tissue. We can also have things like pneumonia going on. So this can be bacteria, fungal, or viral. And for our viral stuff, obviously we can think of things that are currently going on like COVID, but also flu and other viral diseases also lead to ARDS. Drowning can also have a direct impact on damage to the alveolar tissue. Toxic inhalation, so whether this be uh, smoke or chemical fumes, those can also directly damage those cells. Burns, also if a patient's in a fire and we get really hot air that goes down in there that we can potentially burn things that way. So all of these causes that I just mentioned, that these are going to primarily impact that alveolar membrane. But due to the inflammation response, that this can actually lead to further inflammatory changes of the capillaries, which would also meet the same pathophysiologic changes that we just talked about. With these cases of ARDS, though, those microvascular impacts are often going to be localized just in the lungs and not have a systemic effect. And then the other group of causes are going to be our secondary or our indirect causes. And these are going to be primarily mediated by damage to the capillary membrane. And here I want you to think systemic inflammation that's taking place. And so here the systemic inflammation is also going to lead to direct inflammation and damage of the capillaries, which can also potentially spread into the alveolus itself and lead to some of those pathophysiologic changes there as well. So here are some causes that we would consider are secondary or indirect would be things like sepsis, hypovolemic shock, acute pancreatitis, uh, fat emboli, trauma, uh, blood transfusion can lead to a trolley, uh, especially in cases of massive transfusion, as well as disseminated intravascular coagulopathy or DIC. All right, so that was a lot of info to really kind of start out talking about ARDS and really what it is and giving you guys a good picture of what that disease process is, some of the pathophysiologic changes that we see with it, as well as some of the underlying causes that can lead to our patient being in ARDS. In the next lesson, I'm going to dive further into the diagnosis of patients with ARDS and then more importantly, the treatment and the ways that we manage these patients. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube 
YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that. As well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.